Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm really just um, starting this call and then I'm going to be handing it over uh, fairly quickly and just coming back at the end. But um, we are really uh, thankful for each of you that's willing to be on the call today. The, the ground rules are essentially we're going to keep you muted. There will be a chance for some response later in the call, but because there's so many people on this, this call, um, it's, it's um, really not an opportunity for all of us to interact today. Uh, we, we expect there'll be more opportunities and we'll say more about that at the end. Um, so um, just be aware of the dynamics. This is more of a presentation. There's a number of voices. You're about to hear some very significant voices. And I want you to know these people that are sharing today are, are our colleagues, they're our friends, but most of all, they're our brothers and sisters in Christ. And um, so, so this, this is a wonderful opportunity, but in a very painful time. And so uh, we just really wanted to say that, that we recognize that, that we're not trying to solve uh, centuries of um, racism in one call. We recognize this is just the beginning of a process, which will take a long time to work through. Um, but we are very hopeful and prayerful that God wants to do some major healing uh, in our city, in the body of Christ, even in our nation. Uh, but it starts with each of us. So thank you for, for coming on the call. And um, I'm going to um, now just introduce to you the, the MC for this call, um, a beloved friend, somebody I've come to deeply appreciate. He's the president of the International Pastors and Leaders Forum. And uh, we asked uh, Dr. Isaac Gimba to put together with his team those who would be the presenters today over this next hour and a half. And um, we trust you'll be able to stay on the call for the whole hour and a half. But uh, we're very grateful for Dr. Isaac and uh, the role he is playing in our city. Um, and today, we just want to bless him and um, give him the floor at this point. So thank you, Dr. Isaac Gimba, for, for leading us today. Thank you so very much, um, uh, Richard. Um, this has been an auspicious moment. Um, it's a time that um, we have relentlessly prayed and waited and actually cried before the Lord. Um, and it is so exciting to see what God is doing in our city at this moment. Um, perhaps before I make my opening remarks, I would like to um, hand into Joseph, um, Joseph Kiria, who would be um, doing the emceeing today. Okay. So uh, would you like to lead us through the, the emceeing? Uh, yes, I will. And according to our program, uh, we have you uh, share a few, wa few words of uh, opening remarks. Okay. Thank you. Um, brethren, this is a moment like no other. And I want to, first of all, really appreciate God Almighty and the workings of his spirit amongst his church. I'd like to thank um, the leadership of the One Way Ministries, um, headed by our brother, Mark Peterkins, and Richard Longs, and the Love Ottawa, and the entire team. Uh, for me personally, Engaging with the One Way Ministry changed a dynamics of what unity should be like in the body of Christ. Since I joined that team, I've said it times and times again during our meetings, it would appear to me that One Way Ministries is like a similitude of what the body of Christ ought to be. I'd like to thank you for your leadership and the exemplary um, leadership that you are laying uh, and you're accepting for our pastors in the city. Um, I want to thank all of you who have found time to come and to join us. Um, for many of you who have read the passionate letter that uh, our brother Richard sent, it conveyed the heart that the One Way Ministry and our brother Richard and the Church of Jesus Christ has. Um, the coming together today is very profound because it's been a generational 
um, uh, issues that have been over centuries, if you may like to say. But at the same time, the Lord has visited us as a city, as an outcome of a, so much prayers that have gone on. Um, I was talking to um, Dr. Anthony Bailey the other day. I said, men like him who have stood and, you know, through the times and the tough times in previous years in the city when voices were not heard and when he stood out to, to, to communicate some of these ills within the society, um, it, it, it wasn't, it didn't appear as though it was ripe at that moment, but in the fullness of time, here we are. The Lord has grant us, granted an opportunity where we can all sit together around the table and discuss in an atmosphere by the Holy Spirit. And so I want to really appreciate you, Dr. Bailey, for um, standing through these difficult times. I want to thank you, Bishop Rudolph McEwen, standing through the challenging times that you've gone through as a minister in the city. As a minority, there are definitely tough times that you had encountered. But standing and, and, and just trusting God that a day like this would come, for that, I want to thank you. Um, it's because of people like you that some of us are able to have the platform to have conversations like this. Um, and there are, there are others in the city um, that I may not be able to mention at this moment. I want to honor every one of these Black pastors and leaders that have withstood through the difficult times um, in a state where, or in an environment where you might be a minority and yet holding forth. Um, today, it's a brief remark for me. Um, the fact that many of you are on this call, it just goes to show your heart and your desire to see the body of Christ move farther than where it is. And I say this to all our white pastors and, 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 and leaders, um, I want to thank you and to honor you for accepting to be part of this conversation. I know the Lord will bless you mightily. Um, the position of IPLF in this entire conversation, I've said it again and again, is this is a family conversation. It's a family discourse. And uh, we are trusting the Lord that out of this conversation and the sharing of, of our hearts and pains that we have passed through as individuals, as brothers within you in the city, that this moment is going to provide some education. So for some of you, you might be hearing some of these um, experiences and encounters for the first time and the pains your fellow brothers may have gone through. And I do know that the Lord has granted each one of us a heart of compassion, a heart of love, that we can be able to empathize with one another and see the church of Jesus Christ built. Um, this is a divine moment um, that God has made to alter the, oh, the long overdue narrative, which says that as a church, the body of Jesus Christ, that we cannot be so diverse and yet intricately united and purposeful and peaceful. If this narrative were admissible, it would invalidate and trivialize the very essence, nature, and character of our Heavenly Father. If this narrative were factual, it would render the fervent, passionate prayers of our Lord Jesus to his Father for the unity of the church in John 17 irrelevant and useless. And by the way, Jesus made that prayer four times, that we may be one. I don't know that any of Jesus' prayers was not answered by his father. But the outcome to this prayer for unity, however, has been left hanging on the shoulders of you and I to determine how individual responses might culminate into Jesus' passion and the desire for all to be one. It is not too hard for me to be able to understand Jesus' passion and the call for oneness. It's not sameness in the body of Christ. As Jesus Christ was the righteousness of God revealed, so the church of Jesus is the radiant expression of Christ's victory and glory. So part of the reason why Jesus seeks for this unity is because it is the way heaven works and operates. 
It is a channel through which the incredible diversity, even of the Trinity functions. The Father functions differently from the Son. The Son functions differently from the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit differently from the Father, yet they are one. So diversity is rooted in God. See, Jesus says something interesting. He says, it is in our oneness that the world may know and believe that Jesus had been sent by the Father and that the world had been loved by the Father as Jesus had loved the Father. And so sometimes I have wondered that perhaps our lack of unity may have delayed the harvest of reapers. Many souls are out there and they want to know who the Father is through Jesus Christ. But Jesus is saying the unity factor will enhance that to happen quickly. Could it be the reason why Satan has brought so much divisions amongst us to delay or scuttle the purposes of the Father? For the world to know who he is differences are absolutely essential they are critical and these were eternally determined by god and so it is not a wrong thing for us to be different but the challenge there is when the differences do not bring us into the place of unity well and so tonight or this moment today this conversation that we're going to to, um, to kick off is the expression of your brother's heart, your sister's hurt. And my prayer is that as you listen, the Lord will grant you grace to know that he is calling us into a place of a family. From Genesis to Revelation, the heart of Jesus concerning family has not been hidden. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, on whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. There is a family in heaven, there is a family on earth. In the book of Revelation chapter 7, after this I looked and I behold a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Brethren, I submit to you in this meeting that the heart desire of the Lord is that the will of God be done in heaven as it is on earth. As we see a numerous number of people that cannot be counted in different diversity, the desire of God is that in that diversity, it to be replicated on the earth. And this is the foundation for this conversation. I'm asking that the Holy Spirit would help us as we listen to one another. We will realize that God has brought us together as a family in this nation. He has brought so many of your brothers that you've not met from Africa, from Caribbean, and different parts of the world to Canada so that together we would walk in this diversity yet in oneness and bringing out the purposes for which God had intended it to be. I want to thank you very much. I'd like to hand over to Joseph Kiria, who will take on from here. God bless our conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gimba. Uh, next on our program, we are going to have a word of prayer from uh, Dr. Veronica Adu, the pastor of the All Nations Full Gospel Church on Ines. Let's pray, please. Thank you, Father, for this day. There is always the appointed time, and this is the time that you have appointed for us to deliberate over issues that affect all of us. Lord, I ask that as we go into this meeting, it will be a time to reflect on your love, your compassion, and your forgiveness. Let the Spirit of power and the spirit of unity prevail amongst us. You created us in your image and we want to stay in your image. Help us and give us grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Veronica. Uh, it's important for us to understand as we go through these conversations that uh, differences are not just in color, but uh, even amongst us as black people, there are quite a number of differences. 
we have uh, those of us who have immigrated to Canada recently. Uh, like myself, I've been here about 20 years and we call that recent. We also have those who immigrated here many years ago, like uh, Bishop uh, Rudolf McEwen, who celebrated 50 years of ministry in our city. We also have those who are actually born in this country. So those are different variations and different shades among the black community. We also have those who immigrated from Africa. We have those who immigrated from the Caribbean. We also have those who immigrated from, uh, from the United States. Then we have the blacks like my son, Jesse, who was born in Canada. Those are all different variations and we experience some of these things uh, at different dimensions. But today in particular, uh, we have Dr. Anthony Bailey, uh, one of those respected uh, black leaders in our society, in our community, who has been in the city for quite a while. And uh, he has had quite a fair share of experiences uh, with this issue of racism in our city, in Canada, and through his various um, academic pursuits. I want to introduce uh, Dr. Anthony Bailey to give us an overview of what we are dealing with. Over to you, Dr. Bailey. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm going to try to share my screen with you. I have a presentation. Um, thank you so very much. I, I deem this an incredible um, privilege indeed, and I give God thanks for the faithfulness of those who have come with an open heart, and I'm relying on God and God's Spirit to help us discuss and to speak about some very difficult things. Um, I, as a uh, Reverend Kiria has said, this is something that is a, has been laid on my heart uh, for a very long time. Some of you, maybe not all of you, um, know something of my story um, um, that we experienced. We, we emigrated from Bar Barbados to Canada and lived in Montreal, different places, and uh, there suffered a most uh, uh, egregious and painful and tragic reality that is an outshoot, an outpouring, as it were, of um, this very t topic we're talking about. My brother and I um, in, on the streets of Montreal were attacked by those who had um, absorbed and believed this notion of race value to such an a, point, a point that they believed as white people, they had every right to do anything to black people. Uh, they attacked my brother and me and they killed him. They stabbed him through the heart and uh, he bled to death in my arms. And through deep prayer and counseling and the support of my church community, um, I felt impressed by God and God's spirit to be a reconciler. We talk about the ministry of reconciliation. And so for a very long time, through my various pursuits in social work, uh, in counseling, in ministry overseas, in Africa and Caribbean, um, I have felt a call upon my life and upon that which God has imbued me and gifted me with to be a reconciler. Um, and I have to tell you that, um, you know, a reconciler is a kind of a bridge. And you know what happens on a bridge? You get walked on. And so it has been a challenging journey, but one that I believe the Spirit of God has empowered me to make. So I invite you to, with open hearts, open mind, open faith, uh, to listen to that which I want to present that I believe God's laid on my heart. I think that there are two things in particular that has brought us to this moment of opportunity. Obviously the pandemic, COVID-19 has disrupted our routines, has caused us to be uh, thrown off kilter in equilibrium. And that has done two things. Some, one not so uh, uh, healthy in that we've seen an increase in domestic uh, strife and difficulties. When I speak with the police, they tell me 80% of their calls uh, have to do with um, domestic abuse. But in addition to that, though, there are many who've come up with creative and ingenious, uh, loving, charitable ways of caring for people. And we've seen that. And the second thing is George Floyd's, what I call the modern day lynching. Uh, and it, what it did was brought to sharp, into sharp relief a systemic structural uh, uh, imbalance and discrimination, not only in the United States, uh, but we can point to it in our own country and I will be mentioning that. So I think the conjoining of these two realities has made there in, in our community an appetite to see something different. And I believe that God's spirit is using this to curate something powerful as we move forward. So 
I want to start off by talking about how we have not sufficiently recognized the world and biblical history. I'm going to start with world history and biblical history to see that we have strayed away from the intention of God in very structural ways. So the Egyptians and the Ethiopians, let's, let's talk about what these things that we read in the Bible are. The Ethiopian literally means black or burnt face in Greek. Kush is the Hebrew word for black. So whenever you see Kush or Ethiopian or Egyptian, because the Egyptians were descendants of the Ethiopians, we're talking about black people in the midst of the story of the Bible. Greek historian Herodotus, widely considered first great historian in the histories, he said, Ethiopians and Egyptians have thick lips, broad nose, woolly hair, and they are burnt of skin. Ta-da! There you have it. Many of the extraordinary firsts that we read about in the history books, and the problem is when we read about these things in the history books, there's an assumption that is made, and that assumption does not attribute uh, to black peoples these incredible um, um, firsts. The first written records, uh, significant architecture, use of beds and tables, copper mines, the systematic removal of metals from the earth. These were those things, the pyramids also accomplished by black peoples. And also, when you think about the things that you use every day, the things that we all benefit from, whenever you look up maybe in an encyclopedia or, or in Google, and you see who created this or who invented this, um, you see a name. And I would, I would you know, wager, uh, although I'm not a betting person, that when you see that name, you reflexively and automatically believe it's a white person. That's how we've been trained to see. But all of these inventions that you're seeing now were, were invented by people of African descent. The stethoscope, ironing board, baby buggy, the traffic light. Now, I know some people don't like traffic lights, but we need them. The blood plasma bag. Dr. Charles Drew came to McGill University uh, to develop a way of extracting plasma from blood. It was intended to save soldiers on a battlefield, but that is the birth of the, of the blood bank. Anybody who's had blood transfusion and so forth, it is his technology, his invention that made that possible. The pencil sharpener, the lawnmower, the self-lubricating cap, where we get the term the real McCoy, it was a way of, of transcontinental uh, railway um, uh, uh, travel, and many Many uh, inventors tried to make a self-lubricating cap, but they didn't work. And a black engineer, Elijah McCoy, he made one that was absolutely perfect. And uh, people said, well, we wanted the real McCoy uh, from that. The electric lamp bulb, the gamma electric cell, the spark plug in your car, the automatic ga ga uh, gear shift, fire extinguisher, elevator uh, mechanism. All of these were created and invented by black people. Charles Drew. The other thing, we all know and we, we love having um, a search engine, Google and all of that. It was a black person from Barbados named Alan Emtage that invented the first search engine in 1990. He was a computer science uh, student at McGill University. He never sought patent, never registered. He just wanted a way to communicate and with his friends in his faculty, learn how to uh, search things. He would have been a billionaire by now if he had patented that. But the thing that you use, the things you use every single day uh, are such and available because of black peoples. So we want to talk about not only the, the history, but also in the Bible, uh, the biblical examples of the presence of black peoples that if unless you are looking for it, unless you recognize um, how God is using all peoples, for God's salvation purposes and holy purposes, you would not assume that it's a black person. We think about Egyptian. Remember what we said before about Egyptian and Ethiopians as black peoples. Hagar and son Ishmael, although the promise was made to Abraham and Sarah and Isaac, there was also a promise made to this black family. For I will make of him a great nation, the Ishmael. You think also of the, the Exodus. The Exodus, what some people don't realize is one little phrase in that, in that verse 38, um, Exodus 12, called the mixed multitude. In Hebrew, it's called Erev Rav, which means a mixture of peoples. So there were non-Israelites who also participated in the Exodus, not only Jewish people, not only the Israelites, there were people, and if you understand that this is in Egypt and all the surrounding places where Egypt would go out and they would um, raid various uh, uh, colonies and others, you're raiding other black peoples there. And so this mixed multitude that sided with the non-Israelites were also part of that was the black community. We look at one of our, our so-called minor prophets, Zephaniah. 
Remember what we said earlier on. The word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi. Remember what we said? Cushi is Hebrew for black. Zephaniah, the prophet, was black, the son of Cushi. We think also of covenantal relationships that, uh, with people other than Israel. So if you look, for instance, at Isaiah 19, you look and you see that how God has, has drawn a personal and a loving covenantal relationship, not only with the Jewish people, not only with Israel. On that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessing. Blessed be Egypt, my people and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my heritage. God is, is being announced by, by the prophet Isaiah as belonging, these people belonging to him. The Egyptian, the black peoples also belong in special relationship with God. We read also Amos to, to continue and to buttress that, that theme. When Amos is, is judging all the various uh, communities in Judah and Israel, and then he comes in chapter 9 to say, are you are not you Israelites the same to me as the Ethiopians, the Cushites, the blacks? You're the same to me as they are. They're special to me as they are, declares the Lord. And then he goes on to demonstrate that what Amos is saying is that God performed exodus for other people other than the Jewish people. Did I not bring up Israel? That phrase in Hebrew, bring up Israel, is, is shorthand for exodus, is shorthand for liberation. Did I not bring up Israel from Egypt? The Philistines from Kathor and the Arameans from Kir. God seems, the Amos seems to be saying that God has performed liberation and exodus for other people, also including black peoples. The mission to the Gentiles. When we come to the New Testament, here's something else. Well, it's important to see why we, we are, are, have departed from the way things were. The term Christian was first used in Antioch, Jews and diverse Gentiles as, the, as the, the Gentile mission expanded into Asia Minor. But what is absolutely, and the first time we're called Christian is in, in, in uh, chapter 11. I had the privilege of taking some, some of my members to, to Antioch. This is a cave church is believed built on the site where that original church in Antioch back in the first century had taken place. But here's the interesting thing about, about this church in the early years. If you turn to uh, chapter 13 in Acts, you will see that there's a, div a diverse leadership group uh, in, in, um, uh, in Antioch. And what you read there, the names are listed. You have Barnabas, who's from Cyprus. You have Paul, Tarsus, from Asia Minor. But look at this. You have Simeon, who's from Niger, which is a sub-Saharan African country. You have Lucius, who's from Cyrene, which is in Libya, North Africa. And you have Manaen from Judea. So in the leadership, in this leadership of the Antiochian church, you had two Africans. And not only that, but when Barnabas and Paul are being sent out by God, it is Simeon, Lucius, and, Mana and Manain who lay hands on Paul and Barnabas. So two Africans are involved in sending and commissioning the mission of God through Barnabas and Paul. Now, when we read these things, unless you are looking very seriously, uh, and uh, to, to the ethnicities that are there, you miss this point. You miss the reality of the role all throughout the thread of, of the Bible of the role that blacks have, have played, people of Africans. So we have to say, if this is true in terms of the great first that have been done, the inventions that bless human flourishing, uh, the, the ways in which God has, has drawn to himself uh, the Egyptians and the Kushites and Ethiopians and so forth. So we have to say, if that's true within scripture, then what happened? What has frustrated and caused us to be where we are now with this hierarchy of social value with whites on top and blacks on the bottom? It's not God's desire. It has to do with a particular moment in time when the, the notion of race was invented. It was invented by Western philosophers in Europe until the latter part of the 1600s. People were known by their religion, their language, concept of race, all of that sort of thing. Um, but in, uh, in 1684, Francois Bernier, he started to classify people in race. Before people were known by their ethnicities, where they lived and so forth, there was never any world conference that got together and say, okay, the Mongols and the Romans are above everybody and everyone else. That never happened. This was a creation, an invention. So we think that we, we um, the, the people look at the way in which the life is structured now. We think it's always been that way, but it was a moment in time when it was invented. In the 1800s, the term race had become commonplace for racial classification, but the classification had to do with hierarchy. 
So Immanuel Kant, who was one of the, 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 the premier uh, uh, European philosophers, many of you, if you've studied philosophy, would know that, but you probably never heard this part of his quote. Humanity is at its greatest perfection in the race of the whites. The yellow Indians do have meager talent and the Negroes are far below at the lowest level. This fellow quite black from head to foot, a clear proof of what he said was stupid. So here's how race then began to create social value and putting blacks at the bottom of the, the social ladder, as it were. These are high, highly influential um, uh, European philosophers. The Negro can be disciplined and cultivated, but is never genuinely civilized, cannot develop rationality as Europeans can. Among the hundreds of thousands of blacks who were transported elsewhere, when you see that word transported, think of the transatlantic slave trade, went on for 400 years uh, elsewhere from their country, still not a single one was ever found who presented anything great in art or science or any other praiseworthy quality. What did we say at the outset? Is that true? You look at the pyramids, you look at all of the, the, the incredible accomplishments. Is it true what Kant is saying? But this has tremendous influence. Another European uh, philosopher, Hume consistently insisted on the natural inferiority of Blacks, which set them apart. And Hume says, I am apt to suspect that the Negroes and in general all other species of men to be naturally inferior to the whites. There never was any civilized nation of any other complexion than white, nor even any individual eminent in action or speculation. So in other words, is demonstrating now the, the way in which this is being institutionalized. This notion of the hierarchy is now being institutionalized and laws and particular behaviors and systems start to be formed to ensure and enforce that social value. Race is a social construct. It's a socially constructed way of categorizing identity in a hierarchy of value. And it has to do with particularly disadvantaging uh, people of, of, of black heritage. Now, what we know, some of you will be familiar with the 10-year project, the Human Genome Project, that the, the, the most eminent geneticists in the world came together for 10 years and studied 3.3 billion base pairs of human DNA. And what they found is that there's absolutely no scientific validity for the notion of race, no essentialist DNA for black people or white people or anyone. And so what they concluded after 10 years of research is to say race, as has been created by Western Europeans and has been enforced in terms of enslavement and so forth, it doesn't exist, but racism does. In other words, the benefits and the hardship of this created myth is impacting people, but the myth, the original myth does not exist. And so we can confine it to opinions and not pretend that it's some scientific thing. So this brings us to what we mean about systemic racism. People are arguing about this and they say, Anthony, you don't know what you're talking about. There's not systemic racism. Uh, and, uh, and so we need to define these things to understand how the, how the, the um, perpetration of this hierarchy of social value gets ensconced in systems. When institutions and our social systems exercise their power to create or maintain racial in inequity as a result of hidden or blatant institutional biases, policies, practices, and procedures that privilege some hierarchy of the social value while others are disadvantaged. So it has to do with making this social ladder um, uh, institutionalized in systems, in, in, in uh, ideology, and in, in structures. This is the outset, this is the, an outcome of this kind of assumption. So this was in 2016, this is outside, outside my church, one of the doors of my church. You see those offensive um, uh, signatures there. Uh, this was the second time in that year that our church was attacked and, and particular threat to me, myself, my person also. Now, the interesting thing here, not only the N word is there, but the swastika, but you would notice the number 1488. This is a way of asserting who has done this and why they have done it. 14 stands for the, the number of words in an oath to become a white supremacist. So the young person who did this was an avowed white supremacist. He took the oath and 888 eight, eight is the, the um, eighth letter in the, in the alphabet is H. It stands for H. H. Heil Hitler. So it was showing um, a Nazi uh, 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 propensity, white supremacy, and all of those things. But I need to tell a story here that's important. The young man was not 18 who did this. And we as our church, as damaged as we were, as injured uh, psychologically and emotionally by this, as well as people being 
fearful of what might happen to me be before the person was actually caught uh, because there was a personal threat to me as well. Um, and, and so it destabilized our congregation. However, we decided to move in the way of Jesus and Jesus' ministry. Remember what I told you before about being called to be a minister of reconciliation, someone who reconciles. And so we reached out to the young man through what's called collaborative justice. Collaborative justice is an organization that works at the courthouse to try to see if they can find a, a, a less punitive way of restoring the person. And so we entered into a three-year relationship with this young man through collaborative justice, uh, not, not ever meeting him face to face, but sending messages back and forth. We helped him materially get jobs, uh, move forward and to thrive. And by the end of those three years, he had renounced his white supremacy, renounced his, his racism and was trying to move in a positive direction and with work and, uh, and, and change the way in which he related and understood people. God's power is greater than the power of racism and sin. And so, but we have to talk about the reality of where this notion comes from and how to understand it. White supremacy is the aggregate of privileges accorded to white people just for being white and the systems, laws, and institutions that reinforce it. It's unearned power and rights and immunity that includes economic, political, and social power. It's systematically and culturally um, connected with the flip side, which is racism. Now. Now, I want to speak about this because some people have approached me and said, I don't understand this. I don't agree with this notion uh, of white privilege. Let's try and understand. White privilege does not suggest that white people have never struggled or have challenges. The truth is many don't enjoy the privileges. I'm on the board of the Ottawa Mission, and I know there are many uh, white people who come there and clients, and they are, uh, are, are um, struggling with challenges and so forth. So it's not to say that um, there's not challenges and so forth when we talk about white privilege. White privilege does not assume that everything a white person has personally accomplished is unearned. They work hard and so forth. But what we're talking about is because of this social value and all of the, not only the ideology, but the narratives and the assumptions, you know, until very recently, but maybe it was in the 60s, I believe, here in Canada, we used to refer to anyone who wasn't white as non-white. White became the standard against which you measured everybody else. So it is an unearned sense of privilege and opportunity that is not accorded to, to others. So to show and demonstrate this, we look at our own country, Canada's institutional law and policies and the treatment. So despite the narrative of, of Canada being that place, not like the United States people came here, what a lot of people don't know is that African slavery existed in Canada for 200 years. For 200 years, it was the enslavement of black and indigenous people in this country. And a number of Canadian politicians, some very renowned that you would know, uh, and some Roman Catholic priests own enslaved blacks themselves. In fact, it became so bad in Canada that some enslaved black people started running away to Vermont in 1777 to, uh, to get away from the hardships because Vermont, really, in, in the United States, had just a, abolished slavery, which wasn't abolished in the British Empire until 1834. So 1777, many um, Blacks and, uh, uh, escaped to, to Vermont in order to, to get away from that. There are a number of other things that are shown, both in policies and actual laws. Uh, the Chinese who built the, the, the Canadian uh, uh, Pacific Railway that we benefit from, uh, after having constructed that, in which many of them died, then the Canadian government slapped the head tax on them. Uh, and, and, and also uh, there were um, those who, who were being prevented. So in um, uh, the Noirs dans le Canada, la tenté d'enfranchir les Noirs aussi d'émigrer de ce pays. And so it was Wilfrid Laurier in an order of council in 1911, passed that order of council denying blacks from immigrating to Canada. In, 19, in, in, in 1939, Jewish refugee, refugees were turned away. In the Second World War, um, the Canadian government for 20,000 Japanese people into internment camps. You see, if you look over and over, you see that there are policies and laws that have always circumscribed all non-white peoples uh, in this country. You've never heard of a law, you've never heard of a policy, you've never heard of an order in council from the Canadian government that has prevented British and French people from coming to this country. So when we talk about the institutionalization and the structural systemic nature of racism and white privilege, it is that which you find in the ways in which the institutions of society work, not only personal opinions. 
but I am a person of faith. I am a pastor. I am someone who believes in the power of God and the transformation that can come from God. And so this, all this is from God who reconciled us by God's self through God, Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation that is in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself. I believe in reconciliation. We have to work for it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, though, tells us that this does not come easily. It's not easily surrendered. And so it says, and let us consider how to provoke. A lot of people use the, the translation of that word um, as stir. Let us uh, consider how to stir one another. That's not what the Greek says. Paroxysm is, is the word. You think about a paroxysm. You start shaking. We have to provoke one another to love and good works. So the provocation is done in love. The provocation is done in such a way as to draw attention, but to be consistent and persistent in, in, this, in demanding that there be a transformation and a shift in our churches and a shift in the way in which leadership is honored also. That is the truth of things. And as uh, my, my brother, Dr. Gimba, had also began, after this I looked and there was before me a great multitude from every nation, tribe, and people. We as a people have to get used to the fact that there's this equality standing before God, where there's inequality, where there are assumptions of privilege and pride of practice over others. It is not in the imagination of God. It is to be condemned, it is to be transformed, and it is to be reconciled. And I believe that as we plant the seeds of this justice, this hope, this love, this reconciliation, we will birth tremendous, tremendous flourishing of what God desires for us. Thank you very much. The Lord bless each and every one of you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bailey, uh, for that very elaborate um, coverage of the matter that we have, both from a historical perspective to now. And uh, for our next speaker, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Donna Neal to give us a bit of um, a perspective of where things are now. We have had lots of coverage from uh, the historical perspective, from the biblical perspective. And I think that Donna Neal could uh, give us a bit of a perspective on where we are right now. Over to you, Pastor Donna Neal. Good afternoon, everybody. Praise God. It was great to be happy to join you for this special meeting. I count it an honor and I want to talk, talk, thank Dr. Gimba, um, IPLF president, for his wisdom to continue this very important dis discussion with our friends at One Way Ministries. As we seek to highlight with a view and to understanding some of the current issues regarding the systemic racial divide in our nation and how it affects Blacks living in Canada. I also appreciate Dr. Um, Pastor Joseph for his able efforts in organizing the, and the on-the-ground planning with um, Love Ottawa of One Way Ministries and, um, and for reaching out to me to share some perspectives on the particular issue. As um, uh, one who has um, served in this nation, I arrived here um, as a six-year-old with my father, who was on this line, Bishop Rudolph McEwen Sr. And um, when we came to this country, it was, um, for us, it was a quite the, um, the thrill as young girls. I had two sisters, and it was a thrill to be um, in this country, to see snow for the first time. And um, so when they came as immigrant parents who arrived in Canada in the early 60s, um, and that was a result of the federal government's call for professional and skilled workers. Um, and such was my mother, uh, the late Maudlin McEwen. Um, my parents shortly and ourselves as children came a year after, and we came and became Canadian citizens. So I grew up here in Ottawa. And, um, and as I became you know, a Canadian citizen myself, I grew up and I was uh, educated in university, I was, and I was taught, and I worked in a number of systems from the nonprofit uh, system, owning my own business, um, pastoring a church, and also worked um, in the government era, in the government realm. So um, in terms of longevity in this country, um, I'm a proud Canadian citizen. So I was just given a few minutes and um, I don't want to repeat anything that Dr. Bailey had already spoke about, but my presentation will broadly touch on three things. Um, one, 
systemic racism? Where and how is it manifested? And what could or should be done about it? So Dr. Bailey Abley already talked about what systemic racism is, and it refers to some of the rules and practices and customs that once rooted in law. These may have changed over time, resulting in a facade of equality, but the residual effects reverberate throughout the entire social systems. In other words, slavery may have been outlawed, but the residual effects still exist in, in many ways that we see today. And we don't have to go far to, to relate to some of the stunning events that have recently happened over past weeks with the um, George Floyd issue and other incidents that have happened be before that. And state systemic re racism also refers to a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations and other norms work in various, often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity. Some may debate, as um, our, our, our um, Premier of Ontario said, it's not that bad in, 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 in Ontario, or it's not that bad in Canada, you know. But those of us who've been the brunt of actual racism will think, um, think differently. Um, it event, uh, systemic racism identifies dimensions of a history and a culture that have allowed privileges associated with whiteness and disadvantages associated with color uh, to endure and adapt over time. Structural racism is not something that a few people or inst institutions choose to practice. Instead, it has been a feature of the social, economic, political systems in which we all exist according to um, you know, some discussions that were held at Aspen Institute's roundtable. An example of this is while redlining, which is a multifaceted practice of denying financial government and other services to people in certain neighborhoods or communities based on race or ethnicity is illegal, the homes in those communities as a result of long -standing, that long-standing practice often haven't even appreciated at the same rate as in white suburban communities. So where does racism actually manifest itself? It actually shows up everywhere. It's in our employment systems, in our immigration, in our justice, in our um, educational system, in our media, and you know, sadly to say within our church, churches. In the education system, we see it when black kids are disproportionately put into special education classes. That they become disruptive out of boredom. Many are expelled from school and then they are more likely to be criminalized as adults. Statistics Canada data shows that black youth are keen to achieve a higher education. Nearly 94% of black young people aged 15 to 25 surveyed back in 19, uh, 2015 said they would like to complete a university degree, but only 59.9% thought it was something that was possible for them. The gap between hope and expectation doesn't exist for the rest of the population because 82% of other groups surveyed said they wanted to achieve a university education and 78.8% believe that they could. That's the disparity there. With respect to income disparity, again, to Stats Canada data, according to Stats Canada data, Black Canadians make significantly less annual average income than non-racialized Canadian. Example, the average income for a non-visible minority is around $50,000 in comparison to $35,000 Black population. And even in, within the welfare system, the level of standard of living of low-income families who seem to be predominantly immigrants or Blacks remains static. So it really beholds um, the systems um, the church and other nonprofit organizations to do more to create alternatives or programs to assist youth. 
out of these vulnerabilities. And Dr. Um, Bailey had mentioned some of um, what he's been doing in your area, and I'm sure many of you are doing um, many things um, to assist um, to lessen this um, disparity. In terms of hate crimes, as a population, Black Canadians were more likely than any other racial group in Canada to be victims of a hate crime, according to um, data that has been reported by the police. And I work very closely. I was a senior federal official with the Department of Justice. So we created a number of policies put before many federal policies that would assist my specific area between in there was um, taking on files like the young offenders files, taking on the youth criminal justice files, and also programming to assist highly racialized areas. So we have seen over the uh, over the years that and observed that the relationship even between the black community and the police has incrementally deteriorated and if i speak of the church when i came to canada as a young child we we attended a church that was preeminently um white uh, in the city here and um but as i grew in that system uh, in that church um as and i gained friends I noticed later on that some of my friends who wanted to um, were interracially, um, you know, um, connected. My the church, and I guess it was something that was spread throughout the denomination, would not marry them because he was black, she was white, and it's not that happened once, but twice or more times that personal friends of mine could have to leave that church, leave that denomination to go and um, be married. It's those things that as a child, you know, and a, a young person, you know, pressed on my mind that how could this be? This is house of God. This is, we're one family. So, you know, other things like that. My son was, um, is a national um, uh, co-anchor, a national TV here in, in Canada. Um, within um, Toronto at this point. Um, he worked for a certain television media outlets and very experienced and talented in what he does. Yet, as a mother, I've, I've had to sit and watch and listen to his heart about the injustices that was happening in the workplace. And many people that we, uh, we esteem highly, you know, he would tell me certain things that was going on and he had to rely on his faith. There was a certain case that was clearly a human rights issue, um, which I know that he would have won, but because of the way we raised him to you know, dig deep, rely on God for um, you know, deliverance, if you wish to call it, um, that certain thing, God took him out of that. And he, he, you know, he was, um, Every day he had to endure a lot of uh, injustices in that workplace, but yet come out in front of cam camera, in front of the camera and actually carry on as if nothing happened, but we were told and, and helped him to carry the burden. And so we see it in our churches, we see it in our Christian media. And um, if it wasn't for the God that has led us and kept us, and how we raise our, the next generation to keep their heads up, um, as my parents did for us. We were called all kind of names in school, and, um, and my mother taught us a lot of courage and knowing who you are. So it's not just the statistics that we see and know of, but the personal stories that are there. So we come to the place where we can ask ourselves, what should or could be done? As men and women of the kingdom of God, we all here today are family. I, I look at you, I've known many of you for many, many years. The start of One Way Ministries, I was there in the beginning when Donna Lamont was um, you know, coordinating some of that. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And as believers, we are one in this crisis. And therefore we need to link together, not just um, in our, our, our minds or whatever, but you know, link our forces, our hands together against systemic racism, against injustice, against microaggression, and against, against as well the formal, um, the subtle forms of prejudices that we see in our society. Isaiah 1 and 17 is, gives us a roadmap that says, learn to do right, seek justice, 
defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, and plead the cause of the widow. And this is just, you know, basic, um, you know, word, basic that we all quote, basic word that we teach our people every day. And I say, say that systemic racism is not just a political issue or an educational issue or an employment problem, but at its root, it's a heart issue. And so how do we help in this fight of faith? First, we must acknowledge the fact that racism exists. Some don't agree and they look over it, but if it's not rooted out, which is part of our mandate as people of God and as leaders in our own right, our children and our generations will still be dealing with this down the road. Second, as leaders, you can educate. Let's educate ourselves. And then when, while we're educating ourselves around the issue, and we had such a wonderful just learning and teaching opportunity from Dr. Bailey just now. Educate ourselves, then cultivate allies that, and, and partnerships among people. We can learn from the synergy um, of each other to address the problems that many face due to the sin of racism. Yes, I call it a sin. As well, we've got to learn to listen as we all are doing today. Thirdly, recognize that our stories matter. We're not here, our stories do matter. I've always wondered when I was working um, around um, uh, you know, the policies over the years uh, with respect to affirmative action, and I understand why it was implemented. But when, as Dr. Bailey mentioned, you begin to categorize people, that's the first time I'm hearing about the, um, the originating of that categorization. So thank you, Dr. Bailey. But I've always been in the government serv service, health, and, and, and mostly Department of Justice. And every single time we go to a apply, we're given this thing and are told that, you know, by human resources, that we need to check by what we are. So you have black, I'm Aboriginal, you have this. And, you know, so get ahead because the affirmative action policies were instituted to help some kind of, you know, disadvantaged people get ahead or the vulnerable populations get ahead. And I always thought, I went to school here. I spent most of my life here. I know, I don't even know my home country as much. So why if I went to school, grew up in the system, fully educated, have my degree and, um, and worked hard, why am I checking off a box that says black? When clearly you can see that I am, you know, of a, of a different color. So it's policies like that that, you know, are tended to do something, but it's actually in the minds of some, as many won't agree with me, they'll check market. Many of our people will not agree. They'll check market because it gives them, in the way I was raised, I could not do that, and I never have. But God, I'm who? I'm his identity. So those kind of policies, you know, sort of, for me, um, worked against who God made me to, do, to be. And so fourthly, we could use our voice. And, and the, the, you as the um, one-way ministry platform, you could help us to speak up. And even better than that, um, invite us to the rooms and around the tables and those boardrooms where relevant policies are being discussed or ideas are being discussed to get the input from um, those of us who, you know, to be included in this. Proverbs tells us that we should be a voice for those who cannot speak for themselves and ensure justice for those being crushed and see to it that they get justice. You may not be a poster toting advocate and, or marching in the street. However, you as leaders can influence the discussions in the rooms where others may not have the access. And so last but not least, we need to pray. Righteousness exalts a nation. And the Bible tells us that if my people that are called by my name would humble themselves and seek his face and pray, he is going to hear us. He's going to remove the, the filth and the scourge from our land. And so we have a responsibility, church, for justice. 
and especially for social justice and for the spiritual justice within our midst against one another. It's not about achieving, um, you, know, um, e uh, you know, social justice is about achieving equity for everyone. We have a responsibility to address systemic racism, segregation, prejudices, and inequities. So everybody, everybody is able to get their just due until it is all manifested in all of our systems. Just and healing for all should be the agenda for us as a church body and church people and leaders in this city based out of a love for a holy and a just God. And Jesus summed it up in this way when he, uh, when he was asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And we all know what he said. He replied and said, love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Then he went on to say, and the second is like unto this, love your neighbor as yourself. And recently I was listening to a podcast interview with, um, you may all know him, Pastor A.R. Bernard. He's a senior pastor of Christ Hill Cultural Center in Brooklyn, New York. And he was saying to those that were saying to him, can we just move on past this issue, um, you know, and maybe try to build in the future? You know, his response was, if you don't understand yesterday, you'll be confused about today and you will repeat the past tomorrow. This, my friends, is the reason we must seek the wisdom of God and continue these discussions and the love, the unity among us, the fellowship of the, the Holy Spirit based on what we know as children of God. Thank you so much for this opportunity and God bless you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Donna. Um, I serve a president uh, who has insisted that I keep time. And he told me that I have up to two o'clock to make presentations. I still have two presenters, but I want to be obedient to my president, uh, Gimba. He has insisted that he needs time kept and observed in the IPLF. He would like us to spend the rest of the time uh, hearing uh, from, from, from us. We didn't just come here to speak speak to you. We came here to have a conversation together. Uh, the other two presenters that we have, we will be diligent to send their notes to you. And so we're not leaving out what they had to say. We will make sure through the one-way ministries that we send you the notes of the two presenters that are not going to present. But at this particular time, I would like to hand over uh, to Pastor Gimba or to Pastor uh, Richard Long to help us uh, have a conversation. What we really want to do is to hear what it is that you have heard from us so far. We aren't really thinking about solutions at this point, but we just want to be sure that we are all on the same table. We understand the same thing and probably think about what uh, the next step will be. I personally believe that this is the beginning of a conversation. It cannot be a one of those things and everything is solved. This is a beginning of a continuous a conversation and I'm quite sure that uh, we are going to have another round table like this. So at this point, how about I hand over to you, uh, Isaac, and then over to Richard, but we need to engage everybody else. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so very much, for, um, Pastor Kiriar, for your uh, amazing uh, emceeing of this um, conversation. Um, I have had some conversation with Richard um, back and forth, and um, it would appear that we may be able to take at least maybe one more um, presenter uh, before we, um, we get to the response of um, um, our fellow brothers in, the, in this forum. So maybe we can take one, one more presentation before we we handle it. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you put me in a difficult position. I either have both presenters or on <laughs> or none. <laughs> um, I'm quite comfortable uh, having these two presenters, Milton 
and uh, Pastor Emeka. Um, I'm quite sure we shall have another time for them to share what they have, but it's just very difficult for me to choose between the two uh, because both of them have very important things to pass across and I would probably have both present or none of them present. Okay, uh, Richard, what do you think? I, I love um, the way Joseph um, is such, so honoring to his, his brothers. And um, one of the things that we've been talking about ahead of this conversation was that it's, uh, you know, one hour is far too short to really go very deep into this conversation. Though I feel like our presenters have taken us very deep. Um, but uh, that we, we expect that we will call another um, Zoom call like this within a month or so. And if, if uh, those two brothers um, are willing to defer for a month, um, I'd rather hear them speak personally than, than just get a written um, kind of record of what they were planning to say. Is that okay, Joseph? Absolutely, yes. All right, wonderful. Back to you, Isaac. Um, Thank you. Um, thank you so very much uh, for this uh, moment. We feel so honored to have you listen and and just um, know and participate with what the things that we've been through um, as a body of Christ and as your your co-laborers and, and as your brothers and sisters. Um, I do believe that uh, um, you may want to respond. Uh, so uh, we have um, Pastor Jason, would you like to make a response? Pastor Jason Boucher is our brother. He's here in the city. I know many of you know him. And um, he's such a friend of the International Pastors and Leaders Forum. And we thank God for his life and the great work that he's doing in the city. Um, I personally have found some... Uh, you know, compatriot in his spirit, and I just love him. And thank you so much for being who you are. Um, you probably have something you'd like to say. Thank you, Pastor Jason. Dr. Gimba, I love you as well. And Reverend Kiria, you know, Dr. Bailey, uh, you honored us today. And uh, Reverend Neil, uh, thank you. Truly, um, of course, thank you, One Way Ministries, for what you're doing here. Thank you for not only speaking on race, but for doing that so eloquently, um, but for helping us be more like Jesus. You know, as you were speaking, again, this is the culture of the kingdom that is not always evident in our church, in our city, and even in our own hearts. And so I love the word even that each of you brought, but including you, Dr. Bailey, that we need to be provoked uh, to change and to see and so as again, Dr. Gimba and Dr. Bailey have quoted so eloquently in Revelations chapter seven, if racism has no place in heaven, then it shouldn't have any place in our heart, our city or our churches. And so for, <laughs> for me, I would simply say that as a short comment and a response that someone who is white, um, this is a time for repentance. Uh, this is a time to repent for individual and systemic sin of race, the systemic sin of racism. As someone who's white and leads uh, um, a church that has, you know, 67 different nations represented within it, but uh, many of who are white, I think it's important that we repent for caring more about being called a racist, being called racist, than standing up and with our black, indigenous, and people of color. Uh, I think white people have been more afraid about being called that than dealing with the sin of what is. And as I've already heard today, my only response would be reconciliation is not only for the wrong that we have done, but for the right that we have not done. That also is the work of reconciliation. It isn't just, did I do something or not do something? It is the right that I have had the power to do and not done. That also must be addressed and owned. Um, we must start or continue to do. You know, we need to listen. That should be my posture, and our posture is to listen without interrupting, without interjecting, without diminishing, and without reframing. You know, you're all on social media like I am, and it breaks my heart that 
in this instance, somebody who is black cannot even say black lives matter without somebody saying all lives matter, reframing, diminishing all of those things. So we must listen and then we must learn. And for me, again, even as a pastor and as a leader, I have to learn in this season how to follow and how to follow well. You know, I, a natural thing is to take leadership, but in the issue of race, yes, I understand there'll be a lane, but first my lane is to listen and to follow your leadership, your example, those in, to listen to your stories, but then to be a true ally um, that, yeah, and to learn again how to follow. So I think the biggest thing that I'm embracing, and this is my final point, is to embrace how you may feel uncomfortable. You know, for those on the call who look a little bit more like me, embrace how you may feel uncomfortable, that you may not know what to say or do, that this too is very important, that change has a season of where that you lose equilibrium. Let us not grow weary in the discomfort and the loss of equilibrium, but let us have genuine humility. Let us truly be servant leaders like Christ and let us allow our black or indigenous people of color, our brothers and sisters to lead in this way and then let us follow and let us really engage with our whole hearts. And so don't, don't discount this season of me not knowing what to do. And I need you to know, I'll make some mistakes along the way. And you have full permission to call me out and to call me to repentance. Because I know the straight jacket of perfection will just in keep incurring the division of shame. And I want to be able to be humble enough to receive where I get it wrong. And so I open my heart, I open Life Center to each of you to speak into if there are things that you see where we can continue to do better. Thank you. Thank you so very much, um, Pastor Jason, um, for this powerful word. Um, uh, before I say anything, I I'd like to invite our brother, um, Pastor Ryan Dawson, who would also like to respond. Uh, thank you so much uh, um, for the opportunity just to to share, and I think I'm gonna I'm gonna pray as well. And I I'm just so grateful for my uh, brothers and sisters uh, for sharing uh, your heart and uh, your experience uh, with us. Uh, I think uh, I probably uh, speak for everyone, just saying that we're really humbled uh, that you would share your your journey and your experiences with us and. And I think, you know, growing as Jason has said, we want to be listener learners. And this has been such a helpful time uh, as you have shared your stories and your information with us uh, for us to be able to grow. Uh, but I have to say that um, uh, I'm deeply grieved too. Um, and I'm, uh, and I, we need to just on behalf of the church, uh, ask for your forgiveness uh, for the ways that we have uh, been ignorant uh, to your struggle, the ways that we have, um, you know, added to the struggle, either advertently or inadvertently. And uh, Lord, we just need to confess before the Lord um, that, uh, you know, this is not, not our heart and our desire that this would be the situation. And, and as the church, we, we must and, and have to do better uh, in God's strength. And so we're just so grateful and so um, appreciative of your heart to come with such humility to share and 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 bless us uh, with with this uh, with this presentation. And I just want to echo that uh, I really think that this is this conversation is needed, and I would be so grateful to to be on a, a, an additional conversation or to continue this conversation and have other presenters uh, because we need to we need to learn and we need to grow. Um, and so on behalf of the church, I, I just, I do ask for forgiveness uh, for this. And we, with your help, we, we want to be part of the solution and have that posture that Reverend Bailey uh, talked about in terms of being ministers of reconciliation. And so that would be um, our heart that we would be able to do this together as brothers and sisters and really uh, show the world that, that Jesus makes the difference. And, and just before I pray, I, the, the, the passage where Christ um, talks about in Revelation he says, behold, I make all things new. And I just, I'm so grateful that even in this difficult season and difficult uh, 
day that Christ is the one who makes all things new. And we look to him and say, Lord Jesus, you know, may your kingdom come and make all things new and help us be part of that solution to be those ministers of reconciliation. And so um, maybe with that, I'll, uh, Richard, is it okay if I pray? Um, and uh, we can just um, just ask the Lord to, to, to bless our time, uh, seal the things in our hearts. So let's pray. Father in heaven, um, we, uh, we love you and we magnify your name because uh, you are so good and so faithful. And we just recognize uh, the beauty of, of, of who you are, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the beauty of, of diversity and, and unity and, and mutual love and submission. And Lord, what a beautiful picture for us as the church and the way that you've made us. And may we be a, a true reflection of you, Lord, on, on earth. And, and uh, Lord, I, I do personally and on behalf of, our, of the church, I just, I just confess to you that we have not uh, done this the way that you would have desired. We've sinned, Lord. We've sinned against you and we've sinned against Jesus. our brothers and sisters. Jesus. And today we ask for forgiveness for that yes, on behalf of, uh, of ourselves as individuals, but as families and as a church. And Lord, would you, in, in, in the strength of Christ, would you help us to do better, that we would honor you in this, that we would be able to uh, to, to really uh, help our brothers and sisters to bring a sense of unity and reconciliation, that we would be able to lock arms together. Uh, and we long that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, and that you would indeed make all things new. And so, Lord, would you do this? Would you do this in this, this new day in your, in your church, uh, that we would see this come to pass? that you would be honored, that you would be glorified, and that your name would be exalted. And Lord, people would know uh, that we are your disciples because of our love for one another, and we would be a reflection of your goodness and, and your grace. And so we pray this, and we ask for this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Just before we conclude, um, we are um, going to also ask um, from the international pastors, we are going to ask Bishop Rudolf McEwen Sr. Um, to make a few final closing comments. And we don't call it pray for us, but we say bless us. Uh, Bishop, we recognize uh, your 50 years of service of ministry in the city of Ottawa. And as I've always told you that um, many of us are here in response and in answer to the prayers you prayed from the 60s to the 70s through the 80s to have pastors like you come in this city. We have come from different countries, from different nations, from Africa, but we honor you because we know that you stood in the cup, in the gap and prayed. And on this very um, historic moment, when we're not just coming to you as fellow black pastors, but coming together as both black and white, I think this for you in particular, in your journey of ministry is very significant. And I would like you to make the final uh, comments on this and bless our efforts together moving forward. Over to Bishop McEwen. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Pastor Joseph. And thank you all men and women of God who has joined together today in this very, very important venture. It is so important that um, uh, from this time of, uh, from the beginning of this situation with the George Floyd and all of that, my heart's been searching from the word of God some of the solution, uh, what we could come up with as men and women of God. Um, many of my sermon for the past few weeks was based biblically and uh, what I think is part of the solution that God has called us on to. And uh, today you asked me to, to do uh, 
this comment and to and to close and to bless and i could um the, what i could do right now what i my heart um direct me to do is to just for one moment um put our heart back to some of the solution amen biblically amen we ask the question amen what is the answer and i've been asked personally what is the answer and I try not to answer it by my own, but I went to the scriptures and I look to um, the incident with Peter and Cornelius and, 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 and God bringing the, the Gentile into the gospel. And, and Peter, as the man he was, and we all know is, uh, is, is uh, who, who he was very strong and God has called him, but um, the Lord bringing now a different nation in, or, or if I should say it's a Gentile, amen. But the, the, the point is that uh, um, when Jesus, when God let the, the, the sheep down um, and said, kill and eat, Peter in his nature says, I've never eaten anything that is common and or clean. But Jesus said, uh, God says, amen, do not call anything common are unclean, you see. So here we see God is bringing a nation together, the Jew, Gentile, together. Um, um, so here we are again, trying to bring a nation together, a divided nation together. We are divided not because, amen, of the plan of God. We are divided because of man nature, as we heard from Reverend Bailey, very profound. So today I am in agreement with, with we all, trying to put a nation together. That's the heart of God. Peter, kill and eat. We're going to kill, amen, uh, or to bring in that which is necessary for the promotion of the kingdom of God. We are men and women that is working for the building of the kingdom of God. We're not building an empire for our own, but for the kingdom of God, amen. And for the years that I spent in this city, my daughter, Donna, Pastor Donna Neal, she gave a, a good um, background of what it was when we uh, came to this country. And, and I could stretch it even more, but right now it's not necessary for me, amen. But my point is, we are a people, amen, that is determined to um, to do what God has called us on to do. Amen. Get it out of our churches if it's in our churches. And I tell you, as Donna said, amen, we have seen it in the church too. And, um, and, and so on. But here we are, amen, coming, working desperately for God to do a change. Amen. And I think that God is going to do that change. I don't know if you, I, I, I believe that you know that. But um, I, I am certain God is going to do that change. In, I, I look into the scripture, and I'm going to read just the scripture from the book of Agai, amen, to strengthen our hearts, to give us courage. That's what I want to do right now. Just to give every one of you hope, courage, and strength to move forward. Amen, somebody. Amen. And the book of Agai, um, in the second chapter, I'm going to just read this before I bless you all. Amen. I'm reading from verse uh, four to nine. I didn't want to go from the beginning. And I believe that you all know um, the subject matter of Zerubbabel. But here God speaking to um, Zerubbabel, and as he's speaking to our hearts, and I commend you all, amen, and this effort, I really, really, really commend you all, amen, for, for this effort. From verse 4, uh, Haggai in the second chapter, and this is to encourage you, amen, and to let you know that we are on the right track, amen. He said from verse 4, yet now be strong, the rubber bell, says the Lord. And the Lord is telling us to be strong. Hallelujah. And be strong, Joshua, son of Jehoiakim, 
and high the high priest and be strong, all ye people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I commanded with you, uh, uh, commanded with you, when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remain among you, do not fear. For thus said the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and dry land. And I will shake all nation and they shall come to the desire of all nations or to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, says the Lord of hosts. You notice the Lord is speaking, says the Lord of hosts. And he's speaking to every heart in this format now. And whenever we have another one, he's going to be still speaking to the until the nation come, hallelujah, come together to know that he is God and that we are one in the Lord. Amen. Let me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, you have brought us together. In this format, Lord, bringing a people together for your name's sake. As you and the Father is one, even so, God, we are one, never divided. You have called us, Lord, to, to be a nation that of love, a people of love, a people that is called by your name. Hallelujah. So, God, in the name of Jesus, I pray as you bring our hearts together according to your divine word, as you tell us, God, if my people that are called by my, your name will humble ourselves and pray and, and seek your face, you will hear from heaven and you'll heal our land. God, hallelujah, we need that healing virtue come from the throne of grace. So we submit ourselves to you even now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, he must your man and woman is right here now in this format. God, I ask a few for you. Tell me, Father, that whatever I ask in your name, you will do it. Whatever your people ask in thy name, you will do it. No, Lord, my Savior, I pray that peace be upon every man and woman in this format, everywhere, God, that your name is called. Let peace abide. No, Lord, I declare a blessing upon this format. I declare a blessing and a in spirit of unity, hallelujah, upon us all, hallelujah, one-way ministry, IPLF, God, let there be peace, let there be unity, and I declare it, and I bless you all in the name of Jesus, and every brother, every sister who proclaim the name of God and seek, hallelujah, Hallelujah, the blessing of God, and to, to the Ganoness in the name of Jesus, I declare the blessing and anointing upon you and your family and your ministry. Let it be blessed according to the name of God. Hallelujah. And as the word of God tells us, that the glory of God is going to be greater, says the Lord of hosts. So I grant you the blessing, and I lay the blessing upon you right now and the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon your life, upon your ministry, upon your call, and everything you put your hands on to, let it prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Amen. Um, I, I'd like to thank, I'd like to thank Bishop McEwen for that blessing. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, that uh, I just want to say, um, Pastor Jason and um, Pastor Ryan, you truly actually brought tears to my eyes while you were speaking. Um, 
and I just couldn't stop tearing. I just want to thank God for that heart of humility and that grace that the Lord has brought upon this meeting today. We in the IPLF, we designated seven days of prayer. Every night we met at 12 midnight to one in the morning to just pray that the spirit of the Lord would go ahead of us in this meeting. And it's obvious that the hand of God has orchestrated this meeting. And by the way, the things that, that the Holy Spirit has taken us through. So on behalf of IPLF, I want to thank um, Dr. Anthony Bailey um, and uh, Pastor Donna Neal and um, uh, Reverend Joseph Kiria for the wonderful um, presentations and the way you coordinated it. I'd like to thank um, um, the One Way Ministries. Thank you, Mark Peterkins and um, uh, our brother. My, um, always, um, I just love him so much, um, our brother Richard. And I want to thank all of you and all the pastors and leaders that have um, come together today. Something has started that, it, that the city of Ottawa will hear about it. And the other provinces in Canada will hear about it. It will go over this nation. And who knows what the Lord might do with two fishes and five loaves to feed 5,012 baskets can be collected. Thank you very much. May the Lord bless you. I'll hand over to our brother, Pastor Richard, to close with the word. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty speechless. Um, thank you so much, everyone who participated. Um, I don't want to take any more, more of my own words here, except to say that I think all of us realize we've just started this process. We're just starting to listen. Um, I know there was going to be a presentation about some practical things that we could do going forward uh, that was planned in this presentation. And I'm looking forward to convening as many of you again. We'll, we'll give you a date. We'll try to give you some good notice ahead of time. I think we started um, just below 100 and we had, I, I think, 109 people on the call and you stayed on the whole time. So thank you for uh, just your way of honoring everyone who spoke and, and came out to be part of this and we'll get in touch and we'll set up the next conversation. Thank you so much again today for being with us.